Yeah. Well, it's time to call the meeting to order. Uh, if we can have roll call, Sandy. Councilperson Brenny. Here. Brenny. Here. Harry. Yes. Mailer. Here. McGinty. Yes, here. Okay. I'd, I'd like to welcome the guests at the meeting and appreciate your attendance here, as well as the press. Uh, the press is important to communicating uh, what goes on here to the to the citizens, so we appreciate that. Uh, are there any conflicts of interest with regard to anything that's on the agenda this evening? No. 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 Okay. That being noted. <coughs> uh, and then we'll consider under item number three, consent <coughs> agenda A through I. Uh, you have that in front of you. And I believe everyone has a copy of, of the uh, agenda there. So if you want to review that. If there's anything that needs further discussion at any length, we can always move that item off the consent agenda and consider it uh, at a, later in the meeting. I would move passage of consent agenda items A through I. Second it. Is there any further discussion on consent of agenda A through I? If not, we'll uh, have a, a vote. Sandy? Uh, Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McKinty? Yes. Brenny? Here, yes. Brenny? Yes. Perry? Yes. Motion carried. And I might note, too, that uh, Jerry Mayer uh, with Cornwall Freeders and Mayer Associates uh, will be reporting on the uh, uh, audit. And when she arrives, we'll move her ahead in the agenda. Uh, that's under item 6A, so that it's going to be flexible as to when she gets here. So uh, with that in mind, we'll move on to project, Sac City Facade Project, item number one, consideration of approving the CD BG drawdown number 19 in the amount of $16,236. We move to approve the drawdown number 19 in the amount of $16,236. I'll second. Are there any, is there any further discussion, questions? That being the case, there are none, so we'll have a roll call, Sandy. Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McKinty? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Harris? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, item number 2A, uh, consideration of approving Cornerstone Commercial Contractors, Inc.'s bill in the amount of $25,448.62. There's a progress meeting tomorrow, so if anybody's interested in an update, uh, they'll check with me tomorrow. At the end of the day tomorrow, I should have more. What time is the progress meeting? It's from 1 to 2 tomorrow at the library, because we have our gas Iowa utility. Uh, IUB is doing the gas audit here in here tomorrow, so we've got that meeting up at the library instead. How's any updates on the facade pro project as it's... I know they've uh, been working quite a bit at Mooney's, uh, quite a bit of change there. Um, there's, uh, um, uh, I think they're a little behind on where they wanted to be from a window and door standpoint, but uh, they are making progress. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for a new timeline from them in our meeting tomorrow. I would move to uh, approve Cornerstone Commercial Contractor Inc.'s bill in the amount of 25448.62. I'll second. Are there any questions or comments? And this actually, rep this is an actual representation in your estimation of what they have done? Correct, yes. Anything else? If not, we'll have a roll call. Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McKinty? Yes. Brennan? Yes. Brennan? Yes. Harry? Yes. Motion carried. Item number 3A under <clears throat> projects is consideration of approving the city's portion in the amount of $5,089.72. I'll make a motion to approve the city's portion of $5,089.72. Second. <clears throat> Any further comments, questions? Uh, there being none, we'll have <coughs> roll call, Sandy. Councilperson Perry? Yes. Mailer? Yes. 
McGinty? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, item number four, consideration of approving the city's advancement of the CDBG funding the amount of $16,236. This is all part of the schedule as pre-planned to pay, correct? Correct, yeah. yeah. I'd make a motion to approve the advanced payment of CDBG funding amount of 16236. I'll second that. Any comments, questions? So we are on schedule then, Adam, with the funding that's coming out. It's mm -hmm. coming out the way it's supposed to be. Well, the way it's supposed to be is another term. It's taking CDBG, Sandy. What did, what did you figure recently? Two months. Yeah, almost eight to weeks. To reimburse us? Yeah. yeah. Really? Uh, so are we at a point where we need to look at activating them? We're watching it, but right now we haven't needed to. Okay, good. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we'll have a roll call, Sandy. Councilperson McGinty? Yes. Rennie? Yes. Rooney? Yes. Perry? Yes. Naylor? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Item number 5A, uh, consideration of, of advancement of private funding in the amount of $4,122.90. So there was, there was no, <coughs> we're advancing the whole thing, there was no, nothing left. It's not, I mean, it's close enough that qualifying as an advancement is safe enough. I mean, you could technically say, I just received a check, a second half check from one of the um, property owners. So, I mean, you can kind of play those games, but it was real close, Bruce. It was just easiest to over, if anything, it's a sm slight overestimation of how much we're uh, advancing. I would move to approve the advancement of private funding in the amount of four thousand one hundred twenty-two and ninety-six. No, I'll second it. Any questions, comments? Uh, there being none, uh, Sandy, you want to call a roll? Uh, Councilperson Bruni? Yes. Perry? Yes. Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Bruni? Brett, Brett. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, I just said yes already. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carried. Usually it's a complaint when I'm attention. doing the list. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> okay. At the opening of the meeting, we discussed uh, having Jerry Mayer from uh, Cornwall Freeders, Mayer and Associates, PLC, to uh, visit with the council uh, about our audit. And you might notice that uh, uh, Jerry did. Uh, compose a, a lengthy letter summarizing the results of our audit. Uh, with that in consideration and Jerry's being here, we would like to have you present your thing and feel free once you're done presenting to excuse yourself. In fact, we will excuse you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That one might go all the way down when you sit on it. Just to <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of my hand, I had over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gone all the way around. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> there you easy. go. <laughs> Still going. I'm sure it is. <laughs> like our budget, you're shrinking before our. She can kind of lay her head on the table. It's just my size. <laughs> <laughs> Might get shoulder injuries from pet, having your arms. <coughs> <under. laughs> okay, well, I just come. I'm gonna give a brief report of everything we did and the procedures, you know, that we do, and uh, then I kind of go over any kind of recommendations or you know things I said, you know, had, and, you know, and then I'll have to go back to work and you know, people come picking up their tax returns, believe it or not, tonight. <laughs> And uh, so, first I was going to apologize. Normally I'm here in March, so I get here before the actual deadline, you know, March 31st. But things didn't work out real well as I expected at an office. We had a little turnover, and uh, we had some people that had to have their stuff out by March 31st. There's uh, a lot of new, well, there's not new, but there's SEC guidelines where uh, reports have to be uploaded at a certain deadline. Or a bond rate might be affected, so we want to make sure we have all the lower deadlines, you know, first. And I think the, you know, 
Well, you probably know just from working in government, things will get stricter here and there because I think some people have invested in city or school district bonds and lost their money, so they're trying to, you know, get, make sure things are more current and put information. And one of the new things, kind of as a result of certain things, there's, there's something new this year that we um, went through. It's called um, GASB 68, which has to do with um, a pension liability obligation. Page 41 for you guys. And what, that, what, what, what that's about is uh, the city sack cities uh, participates in ICO. You heard everybody talk about I vision and contributions to the pension plan. Well, it's a pension, it's a state pension plan that everybody's a member of. All the schools, all the cities. There's some county hospitals. You know, the, I mean, the police have a you know a, a different part and so on. You know, this GASB, which is um, governmental county standard boards, looked at it. They thought, well, really, everybody should put their share of the liability on the, on your books because it's not owned by anybody, it's just a joint you know, consortium. So um, the state auditor's office worked with the IPERS and they did their own audit and they ended up having what they call an unfounded pension liability of about four million, four billion dollars, give or take. For, um, and so then everybody that's a cruel basis has to report their percentage share on the, on your books. But since your cash basis, I don't have to you know, put it as a liability just to disclose it. So there's um, it kind of shows um, your liability on page 41. So basically, it, uh, this, your, the city Sac City shares 478,000 of that liability. And just for information only. Because the state law right now says you, they can't upgrade the funding. They can, by law, I think it says they can increase it by one percentage. You know, either way, but they can't go in and assess you $478,000. So here you go. So I think it's just we have to disclose it because like it's a contingency that you know that there is some liability there. But they think I think it's pretty good because they've got 87 percent of their pension funded for the future, and that's all you know by estimate, actuary evaluation. But on your day-to-day -day operations, it doesn't affect anything, any of your budgeting or anything. But that was this, that was something new this year. I just wanted to point out. And on that, uh, we went. We came here for like, two of us came here for about three days, and we went and we did uh, went through the records. Uh, early before we came, I put together put together this annual financial report, you know, for with, uh, from the books. And what that is, that's an annual financial report that you send to the state. And when I do that, I make sure that your cash, I take the beginning cash plus the receipts, less the disbursements, to equal the ending cash. So that goes through the records, and then not only does it do it by in total, but we go by fund. You know, so that's why um, you know sometimes you take into account like the transfers to make sure you know, when something got transferred, and so all that balanced out, no problems there. And then when we came and did the regular field work, we did some some audit procedures. We do is we do outside confirmations with your bank. Like they'll write a letter to all the bank and the debt. Make sure the debt. You know, matches their records, the cash in the bank matches, the CDs do. We write to the state of Iowa, make sure all the receipts <coughs> they said they gave you matches like the road use, your local option sales tax. We look at your utility bills, and if your ordinance says you can pay five dollars per thousand gallons, you know, that's what the customers get charged. Um, and then we look at some your disbursements, if there's a bill written. You know, if it's supposed to be for a uh, police, you know, car repair, it's put in police and not sewer fund. Uh, you know, that's in the right category and it's uh, approved by the council and published in the paper. Because you know, besides just the looking at financials and the numbers, we also look at code compliance. Are you doing things in accordance with the Code of Iowa or a grant agreement? If a grant award says you can only spend, you know, the federal dollars, like your facade grant for certain things, that's what you're spending it on. So it's a little more involved than like a business audit. So just kind of let you know some of the procedures you know that we do. We also kind of review all the controls just to see if uh, you know there's some controls in place to prevent something from being miscoded or you know mis misappropriated, I guess. <laughs> and when I get all done, we put together this audit report. 
So that's in a nutshell, it kind of explains the audit that came in and the procedures in the, the first couple pages of the report. And then we get all done, we put it in an um, audit report format. And on page 12 and 13, it gives you like the overall view of the city. And that includes all the funds, the gas, the sewer, and the airport. And you can see it had, the city has a million dollars of cash at the end of the year, and it had a million dollars at the beginning of the year. So, so it had like an overall loss of like 48000 So pretty much that's pretty you know, straight break even. So. And that's kind of the goal is not to, you know, or have some, to have some cash on hand, but not to overtax anybody. And that just shows that the reason they have this format is on the left side shows all the disbursements. And then there's some direct income that goes against it. So like if you look under like culture and recreation, the city spent $200,000 on culture and recreation. But then you got some direct charges, and that would be like the pool receipts or library charges you know, are in that budget category. And there'd be like a few small grants. And if you go over to page 13, there's a negative $171,000. And the reason the format's like this is that shows that the city's property taxes, local option, it uh, helps support those activities because they're not self-supporting. So, and that's the reason for this, you know, format. So if your um, tax constituents or they want to know where their tax dollars are going, that's why this format's. You know, and say, okay, for every, we're supporting the, you know, police and the fire, we're supporting, you know, the roads, and we're supporting this by this many dollars. Because so, some people do ask, ask that, and I've worked with some cities, you know, with, when you talk about the, the shrinking budgets, uh, where they do a little bit of what I call net budgeting, where you take your, like on the pool, the pool's the easiest, because you can see you got some receipts, and you got some disbursements, and then you got a net figure, and the net lot. I mean, I haven't seen a pool that made money yet, but you take the net loss, and that's the property taxes they're asking for. And so then you try to work with your department heads and say, hey, this is how much money you have that the property taxes will support. So you can spend more money, but you got to have some more income up on top, you know, because we only got so much, you know, property taxes to go around. So that seems to work pretty well. But that was just some ideas I just kind of threw off with the view here. And then in the front, Adam did this management discussion and analysis. So that's on page eight. And that kind of shows you, shows you like a little breakout of differences from one year to the next. The first, uh, the first page here on page eight, that's the, your um, governmental funds. And you can see there's like $1.5 million in last year's 1.7. And the main difference is there's some more transfers. You'll probably pay for some capital projects. And then you can see the, well, there's a lot more public works is spent in the year before because there's some you know, road projects with that money you got from the state. From the state. But it's kind of a nice way to you know, do a comparison from one year to the next. On page nine is a little comparison of enterprise funds, the water sewer. And it really didn't change too much. I mean, some of the revenue went down, but the expenses, you know, for the direct cost stayed about the same. It all, our utilities, it all kind of depends on the weather, how dry it is, wet it is, cold it is. And we do kind of go through a um, like analysis on the utilities to see if it kind of makes sense from one year to the next. I'll look at like the net profit, you know, on the gas to see if that stays real consistent, like, you know, with your purchase gas adjustment to see if that stays consistent. And, and then we kind of look at the records to see there's some um, reconciliation of income to show here's your beginning receipts plus beginning balances plus receipts plus all the disperse with all the payments, usually like the ending accounts balance, kind of even made little control procedures. So 
So any questions so far? Okay, then I'll, I'll skip ahead down to the back where I had any what I call comments and recommendations. Page 57? Yep. And the first couple of ones I've had every year, there's like some segregation of duties, and you do a pretty good job, but there's some things that you could, you know, you know, to be a complete segregation of duties, you probably have to have, like, uh, take turns, like, balancing the bank account or having somebody sign off on reconciling the bank and rotate all the jobs. Um, like, if you look at utilities, you know, Dee Dee does most of the utilities because she does the billing and, you know, posts some of the, you know, the most, majority of the receipts. Other people do, too. But you can kind of look and possibly the council could be involved and, you know, come in and, you know, sign off on bank reconciliations, you know, if you want to or, you know, if there's something, I've had one city one time, uh, you know, their insurance company had a little problem with the segregation of duties comment, so we sat, we sat down and figured out how everybody could, <coughs> you know, sign off on everything so no one was doing anything in <coughs> function of themselves, so that satisfied the insurance company. So if that ever comes up, just kind of let me know and I can, you know, kind of go through procedures, see if there's some, some way you can, you know, sign off on everything. Uh, the second one is just putting this booklet together. Technically, according to auditing standards, the, the staff here is supposed to have this booklet all put together in this format. I'm just supposed to come in, you know, audit the, the financial statements plus the footnotes. And then realistically, that doesn't happen in rural Iowa. So. I'm not saying that governing auditing standards are, um, how would I call it, how, <laughs> applicable. <laughs> but they're written for big size cities. You know, big size entities, and there's no such thing as difference between little and small. And then I just had, um, if I was telling you earlier, we go through like the uh, compliance issues. And there's a couple areas that were over budget a little bit. That was like debt service. That was on page. It was like five hundred dollars or something like that. <coughs> It wasn't much. Just, and debt service was five hundred dollars, and and capital projects was over like one hundred and fifty six. Can't remember what that was for, but yeah. Probably the airport. <laughs> I think it was the airport. Yeah. I think it was the airport. <laughs> And that's all that, I mean, there's no, con I mean, it's not really any consequence that we just comments over budget and, and everybody who knows it's, you're supposed to stay under budget. The hardest part is on city budgeting, you're supposed to budget by function, not by fund. So you've just been through your budget process, so I think they kind of told you that, so. And then we just look at uh, one code compliance things, we make, we make sure all the minutes are published, you know, on the paper. Jerry, if you don't mind, I yep. just wanted to step back for one step second. Uh, 2B, 2B-15. Yep. Yep. Um, you talked briefly with me about yep. it, but I kind of wanted the council members right. to hear your comment associated with um, right. with the uh, non-for-profit entities. Yeah. Would you mind sharing yep. with them your concern there? Yep, that's the next one on the list. Yeah. So there was, I was just looking at this just as a, you know, kind of as a overall thing is that you have, you just, you have some yearly, I call it, you know, allocations to some nonprofits. And the, the Code of Iowa always wants you to look at is that expenditure for public purpose, is that for the you know, public purpose of the city, you know, because we're a city here and we're you know, trying to do what's best for our citizens. And what they're trying to get at is you don't want to do anything to, to benefit like, like yourself personally, you know. So what I was kind of thinking is, I mean, I really don't have a lot of problem with, uh, you know, with uh, you needing like the daycare or you need like that rec recreation center because there's a place for the kids to go. You need to draw people into town, you know, and make sure Sac City is a viable community in the future. But I was, my concern was it should maybe just be documented that this is why we're doing it this way, so someone can't come in and say and it's a really, really gray area in the Code of Iowa. There's not like a right. It's just like 
the IRS tax code is not really. And, and on your recommendation, we passed a resolution yeah. associated with this newest uh, mm -hmm. budget, and I'll be sharing that with you next yeah. year to see if you think it's. And that's the reason I brought up, like, when someone came to in the Sac City and said, well, they want to start a daycare center, and they said, well, well you know, you support this nonprofit one about me, you know, and you don't want to have some or another business or, you know, just say, well, can you support us? I mean, there's other economic incentives you can, you know, do with property taxes and, and you know, what they, they build a new building and stuff. But that was my concern was that if, if another uh, you know, for-profit for came in, was want to do something similar, or another? You don't want to get every single nonprofit coming into the city too, which they probably do anyway. But that was the main reason I wanted to put that in there, since the hist so you know the history and the, the council changes every so often, the mayor changes every so often. So, so yeah. we just need a summary stating our reasons mm -hmm. why, and yep. we passed a resolution along with the right yep. saying that we found these these causes to be of public, uh, interest. Of, of public interest and benefit to the city and therefore we're awarding things. I mean, is that? I think that should be fine, yeah. If not, she'll tell us about it mm -hmm. next time. <laughs> 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 Gotta have something, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I just have one. Um, the the Any wording that you'd suggest to where we can legitimately exclude like you say, a private business coming in and asking for you know similar support, or is it? You might want to ask, maybe just ask the, um, you can ask your attorney, I can give um, Adam some code sections, you know what the code okay. sections are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. just a little bit more legal definition. Because there have been some, some uh, cases where uh, <coughs> they've gone to like, um, not the Supreme Court, but the there's a, well, they, whatever, the an attorney general's opinion, because they had a retirement parties for someone that's been there for 30 years. I know one of them I've seen in the past is yeah. uh, um, having groups like art councils or things like that give donations to a student going to Germany to study art or something like that, and right. whether or not that is in the public's interest or if that's a gifting and... Uh, you, you see those type of questions asked. Yeah, once in a while, yeah. Or they even have things where you have a family, a company picnic. They don't, they think that's like not in the best interest possibly of <laughs> the city. <laughs> or flowers, you know, like if um, Adam's wife passed away, you know, we're really not supposed to send him flowers because that's not in the public interest even though you think employee morale should be. But they've been stuff got big on an attorney general for stuff like that, so I thought, just to protect yourself, it'd be nice to have something. Okay. And then I think that was about it that I just had. Well, except the last one, on the last page I had, the revenue bonds, you got to make sure you didn't quite get to the 110%. I believe we'll make it this year. Yeah. This coming. Man says you'll be working. It takes a while because once you turn it out, it takes a while to get that rate increase, and that's just to help keep your bonding, you know, um, rate interest rates down. And then I think a couple of times the minutes were a little late. They were published within 15 days, and that's hard to do with a weekly paper. There's no exceptions in the code for a weekly paper. Like I said, some things aren't written for smaller, yeah, smaller places. And you typically want to motion uh, yeah. accepting right. the <coughs> bindings of the honor. Right. Yeah. Does anyone want to entertain a motion to that effect? To I accept? would move to uh, accept the report from the auditor. I'll second it. Any further <coughs> discussion or questions? Say so thank you for all your work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks for having me. See yeah. you next. February. Yep, thanks for letting me go. I'll let it out. Like I said, I apologize for us next year trying to get here by March. <laughs> but we did get it to the state on time, so we met that deadline. So. Just to be official, we'll have a vote. Yeah. Uh, Councilperson <laughs> Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Brandy? Yes. Bruni? Yes. Perry? Yes. Motion carried. Good. Do Thank you very easy. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it does create some confusion. It does. Yeah. <laughs> we answer Sandy does one. a good job of enunciating her, her words. <laughs>
<laughs> they criticize me when I have to do it. Sometimes. Oh no, I forgot the book. <laughs> I got a little trouble. I, she was gone that day, so I, I snuck her annual ledger back with me so I could have, do my footnotes. And I, I was supposed to bring it to the I'll UPS it. But, but don't, don't feel bad, Jerry, because. Hey, maybe Bruce can you know, I, I work at Grace Lutheran Church in Fort Dodge. Oh, yeah. Joan, send, send you it. You know Joan, right? Yeah. Yeah, send it with Joan. I'll probably, she'll be a, a youth group tomorrow. She'll be, yeah, she'll be a youth group tomorrow night. Send yeah. it with Joan, and I can, I can bring it back on Thursday. Okay. Don't don't feel bad. The airport uh, documents or files sit over here for a month because I thought they were left here by the community foundation organization, and so I just left it in here for them to pick up. And a month later, I finally opened it up and saw it was the airport stuff, and so I contacted the airport. <laughs> hey, you might want to come get your stuff. It's been sitting here a month. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you send that with Joan, or just drop. Yeah, it I'll send that with Joan. Yeah. Sure, or or just that. drop it off at the church. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She has. Um, I know she has. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Thank you. Have a good year. Sounds all. Be nice. So we'll move on to item number five: citizens' opportunity to address uh, the council on items not on the agenda. And please state your name. And your there's a three minute uh, limit yeah, for you. John Newman is my name. I wasn't here for a meeting. This should have been brought up, but um, last minute he get voted to take uh, some city money to help tear some of these houses down. Roughly 30 years ago, I was ordered to take down a garage. Nobody offered me any money. Any. I was told to do it. They also told me how much a certain person would do it for. You do it for you. Now, why can't some of these owners be responsible for these other buildings? Well, I think the majority of them, John, are, are not. Yes, we said, I, yeah. I wouldn't ask if I had the money needed. Yeah, but they're not here. They don't, they're absent. Well, yeah. A lot of them, a lot of them haven't paid their taxes for 15 years and trying to get them to do something with, I know when that. they won't pay their taxes. I, I agree with him, yeah. I know what you're getting but at. They, they, they are served, aren't they, to take it down? Yeah. But they are responsible for it. I mean, yeah. but they're yeah. served. Yeah. They, they get served legal papers to take it down. My understanding in the no, way I wouldn't serve any paper. I mean, it's all verbal, but I was yeah. flat told. My understanding in the process, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the finer details of it, but I think at some point there becomes a point where the city can either take the property, mm -hmm. tear it down and assess it, or ask the courts to fine them um, and request the court, court order them to take action on the property, and then you might be able to hold them in contempt of court. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's been a case of one getting head, taken to that step in our county in some time. But I think what does happen when the city does take the property, take the building down, it goes back onto the taxes for that property. So the property owner is charged for it. Now, whether they pick up... Yeah, I understand that. Whether they pay for it or not, you know, I mean, it's... Um, and we're really glad that we have citizens like you who are willing to comply mm -hmm. with take the building down. Um, I think probably some of the people would have a different response, and it might involve a salute with one finger or something <laughs> like that. And um, I think that, you know, it's great. I, I wish... It actually ha just happened with two more houses, too. Jerry Yule bought one and tore it down on his own. Yeah. And then Hoosiers bought the other one and tore that down on their own, too. Yeah. So there are some people that are doing it on their own. I think but we have either no. signed off on or they're in the process, whether it's us or someone else, mm -hmm. there's going to be between 10 and 12 houses taken down between in the year 2016 based on what we know right now. That's good. A lot of I know, you know, depending on the city funds, you ought to do it, you know, but it is we, private property. Yeah. None of us and, wants to do that, and I think it, but... Maybe by doing it, we also are benefiting the doing the public good. If we if people say, okay, they're going to come in and do it and charge me for it, some of the other people may jump forward and do it on their own. I think we went for it a number of years without people thinking that there was any threat that it would happen. Well, so you know, and if you decided I don't want to tear down my garage, you know. Then you have a standoff. Yeah. 
Now, what would happen if I didn't, you know, refuse it? I don't know. But, but I was told so and so to do it for so much money, pay. I knew he was on the corners. Right, and that's. That's great. We're really glad you did. And um, a responsible property owner would do. That. But, yeah. Yeah. The only really wasn't that bad neither time. You know, Adam, would it? I mean, is it reasonable that we go the route of, of finding people and, you know, isn't that go on a public record where they would be held responsible if, if, you know. I would think that the appropriate place for this to be discussed planning still would be for the representative yeah. from planning and zoning to take it back yeah. to planning and zoning and discuss it with them. Well, okay. I think in the past experiences, they've tried that route, and they keep giving them 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, nothing ever materializes, and then all of a sudden, after a period of time, it's, it's interest is lost in it, and then mm -hmm. another party comes along, starts all over again with the new planning and zoning, and it goes through the same thing. Right now, I will have to give them credit. They're, they're going through the motions. It may not be the most appropriate way we'd like to have things done, but it's doing it according to the law, serving him, giving him the opportunity, and then demolishing the property. That's, unfortunately, to better our community, that's what we're going to have to do. Even though it does cost us money, I think in the end it's going to be an asset to our community. You know, I, I happen to, this was several years ago at one of the Iowa League <coughs> meetings that, I think it was the city of Marion, <coughs> does a very good job of serving that, taking it to court. And they've used some techniques where they've cured the judges of repeatedly doing the 30 day or how many days notice. It's kind of called them on it. And uh, I'll see if I can find those notes or something. That'd be good. And of course, uh, in May, you're going to have the visit from the lady that you spoke about from Agent 12. Okay. It's going to cover some of that issue. Thank you. Yes, thank good, you, John. Good point. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Thanks right. for being a responsible property owner. Okay. Any, anyone else on the citizen's opportunity? If not, we'll move on to uh, uh, 6B, consideration of hiring pool staff. And Adam, how, how do you want to handle this? Uh, but. Kyle? It, Kyle should be the one to present okay. this. Okay, Kyle, you got your sheet. Okay, um, I know we had... <laughs> you guys rigged this chair? Yeah. 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 All right. I'm surprised you didn't put a buzzer in there. So. That way you don't take so long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're done with you. <laughs> Three X's. Okay, um, well, like I, I explained um, with Larry Worley and, and uh, Teresa, that uh, when I was adding up how many lifeguards I had, uh, I'm, without the 15-year-olds, the I am actually down one lifeguard. Um, with, that, with that said, uh, last year the lifeguards even got overworked, and that's what started the whole people getting called in and working over 40 hours and, and so on and so forth, even though it didn't apply to uh, the 19 and 18 year olds, those are the ones we got called in on. And they focused on our 15 year olds um, with the rule that they can't work more than four hours with a half hour break. Uh, it's nine o'clock, not seven o'clock. They can't work past nine. Um, once it's Memorial Day, I think that's when that, when that starts. Yeah, there's changes at different points in the season. Yeah, it changes the nine o'clock past Memorial Day. Um, um, my proposal would be, to, in, instead of going through all of the, uh, my proposal will at least have 15 year olds work three and a half hours, uh, and that's it. And I can either shift them three and a half at the beginning or three and a half at the end. Um, because if they're going until nine, the pool's only open until eight. Uh, obviously, some of those times when we have a swim meet, those 15 year olds will not work that night because sometimes those swim meets go past nine. Um, but if we cut it off at three and a half, that means we don't have to worry about break and we don't have to worry about going over 40 minutes or 40 hours a week. Uh, and we don't have to worry about them clocking out five minutes past like four hours and five minutes. Uh, so For that to work, how, how 
feasible is it for them to fill in for someone else then? If, in that type of case, I'm just trying to play. This I have enough. I have enough 15 year olds to have most of them as fill-ins, um, and I'm going to give my full-time status to my first, the ones I had last year, because they're all trained up. And, and let's be honest, a lot of 15-year-olds didn't want to work eight-hour days anyways. Um, but it's just a, it's a matter of, it's a matter of telling, uh, telling our senior guards, the 16 above, uh, saying that they can only, if you're going to have a 15-year-old fill-in for you, it can only be a three-and-a-half-hour shift. Um, that he can't work an eight-hour shift. That's, so do you have an employee handbook that would articulate that to them? Yeah, yep. So and so the, the, the violation of that would result in termination of both employees? Immediate termination, yep. Yeah, a, a, you know, a written policy like Bruce had mentioned, and maybe even have them sign off on it, so yeah. that that you have an initials that yes, they did in fact receive it, and and probably have a meeting ahead of time uh, with all of them, so that they have a clear understanding of what's expected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just, we can't afford to have a another mishap. Like that. Another mishap, no. you know. No, I understand. The so risk so, the so they have to understand the situation. And sign off on it, and we have to have you know a, a, a written trail, you know, proving our efforts in case we would run into any. Questions. Unfortunately, even that does would not cover a violation because they don't care how it happened; they yeah. just care that it happened. They just care it happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, my I mean, problem is is how are the sixteen-year-olds going to be responsible enough to follow these guidelines to the letter? The fifteen-year-olds. Those sixteen-year-olds that are calling the people in if you know, for a replacement or whatever. I mean, I can see how the hours can get flipped around for the replacement people coming in, and it would be awfully easy to, you know, to violate those particular rules. And whether it's accidental or intentional, you know, if if there is a problem and we are fined again, it's going to be a lot more than what it was originally, yeah. and uh, there's going to be a lot of the extra people in town, our housing and everything, that's going to lose money in their budget because mm -hmm. of that. that. That worried me tremendously. Yeah, and... <laughs> It worries me too, <laughs> uh, and I don't. And I don't expect you to take a risk, but with if you but don't hire fifteen-year-olds, you don't have enough staff. I was gonna say, but also not having enough staff is not gonna be yeah, good for you're our. You're gonna leader. overwork. I mean, you're, the, your pool operating pool hours is is uh, fifty-six hours a week, some roughly around there. I have eight lifeguards that I would be able to staff um, at the beginning of the summer. Four of those lifeguards are softball players. And I won't see them till midsummer, except for the weekends. And the rest of them are 15 year olds. And we have a drill team one. And a drill team one. There's camp. And if, if any of my eight life, my my eight, um, I'd say my core lifeguards go on vacation, go on a trip, you're going to be short staffed. And so if I can't fill them in with these 15 year olds, or so could you put a policy in place that if they need. To, if they need to find a replacement, they cannot call one of the 15-year-olds. They can That's only what call. That's I'm thinking too. Is you can't call 15-year-old for a replacement for for the older. The 15-year-olds can only work their scheduled hours. Yes. Yep. And that's it. That's if it. you need a replacement, you cannot call on one of the 15-year-olds. Yep. So now, if I can live with that, I've got, I've got a. Makes it less sticky. I have I yeah. have the old the old one in front of me. Some of the new one sitting at home. How many 15-year-olds do we have? All the ones that. One, two, three, right four, five. I have five. five. I have five. So, yeah. so there are five. So looking at this, looks like there. Last year, you had you operated on what, thirteen, fourteen guards. Um, more than that. Thirteen. That we had thought it was. I think well, it was we added. Two. We had eleven, and we added and two we, to get to thirteen. Yeah, we added two to get thirteen. Yeah. yeah. So you so you've got, like twenty mm -hmm. names here. Yeah. Did your additional two you were expecting? There's a lot of them, like you said. You thought there might be softball, more? They're in drill team there. In right. The... I mean, I, I... My additional two? <clears throat> yeah, you'd mentioned you thought there might be more. Um, I... Let's see. I put them on there anyways. Sydney Richardson. <coughs> okay. um, I don't have her application yet, but she worked for me last year. I know she's served by lifeguard, and... She'd be there all the time. Yeah, she'd be there. Is Megan Cook she doesn't be get around? There. I don't know. She applied, she's so she applied for me. So and Cindy's sending me her, but Cindy doesn't get there till mid. Uh, Cindy doesn't get there till mid. Uh, um, 
Midsummer. She's going to be gone for a week. Well, with those with those twelve twelve lifeguards, it was it was very <coughs> difficult to staff them. That that's why I mean, you look at someone like Jordan Fisher, Ali Ali Mountainocker, um, uh, Maddie. I mean, they're working over forty to staff that pool. And no nineteen year old, eighteen year old should have to work. I got one other question I have. So if the five 15 year olds are working three and a half hour shifts, mm -hmm. and I think our current policy is that they have to work 100 hours in the summer in order to get their training reimbursed, mm -hmm. uh, what are we, are they, we need to make sure that they're aware of that. So if I say I got my lifeguard training and I got 96 hours, I mean, I mean, I think. That's something that we probably need to articulate and spell out to them pretty carefully. I think if we put this kind of rule in place, um, and this is just off the cuff, but I would apply it to both years. Because their lifeguard cert lasts two years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if they, let's say they work 50 hours this year, and they'll be 16 next year, 100 plus, then pay for their lifeguard cert. But I don't know. How does the policy read on that? Policy reads the other way. 100 policy. hours in a year. So we would have season. to look at revamping that policy then. Well, you're revamping the policy for the 15 year olds too, so that's why I'm. Does the policy say no, six, no 15 year olds? No, it does no. not. Mm -mm. So we're not really revamping a policy. We're just putting one in place. We're, we're well, yeah, I mean, saying it, that we can. Our I mean, if the, pol the policy doesn't say anything at this point about age of the employees. No. Correct. No, so we're not really changing saying. the policy for that. You're just adding. We're not, uh, there, there, there's no policy that's being changed here. Oh. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're, uh, it's, a hiring, it's a hiring process. It's a legal hire to hire a 15 year old. Yeah. It just happens that there are more stringent Rules. requirements that we have to abide by for them. Yeah. They're bound, and just so maybe make sure everybody knows, they are required to have a break uh, for so many hours worked in a day. They are, um, there are limits at different points in the season on how many hours a week they can work, how late they can work, and how many hours in a day they can work. And that varies depending on what point in the season you're at. It's Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh -huh. Correct. They can work till 8, <coughs> work till 9. <coughs> That's your 15-year-old. That's my 15-year-old. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come across this where, uh, say, a your 18 year olds needed a day off and they couldn't get one of their own age to fill in splitting their shift with two 15 year olds Is well that, if that's put in place they wouldn't be able to do that yeah well like Teresa said they just worked her yeah yeah I mean that's gonna or like what that, happened last year we would just have I to close like the, the slides I had that like question that, before so. you come up with mm -hmm. that and pretty well answered my idea I mean I think that would probably be the Simple, How long on most days do you operate with eight guards? <clears throat> Four to five hours. So One to five. So after five, you start after gradually five, reducing below eight hours. Take them because that's, eight eight that's summer time. That that pulls. I mean, you're you're talking ten to fifteen people past the time of six thirty, and then it's like one to two until eight. So then I only have some two guards there just to just to be there. So, and then granted, if there's like extra cleaning or training we can do, we'll keep them. The um, idea so behind the hundred hours issue was there needed to be some kind of stipulation to identify someone who basically earned um, a response. There was another stipulation of that too. It wasn't only a hundred hours. It was a hundred hours and they stayed through the season. In other words, they had to get the blessing of the, uh, of the pool manager uh, to say that they qualified to receive the reimbursement. If the pool manager did not recommend a reimbursement, um, there was not one put forward. Um, There's no law saying we have to reimburse? No. No. Mm -mm. <coughs> Any other further discussion on the pool? So the um, so the employee handbook 
would clearly outline that the 15 year olds would only have their three and a half hour times. The three and a half hour shifts without switching from. I'm, I'm trying to rewind what everybody said. So. And it would clearly outline that if someone were trying to get a replacement, can't get a 15 year old. You right? would not be able to get a 15 year old. It would outline that that would be termination by both. By both. And but the, but the, but, the, mm -hmm. but but we're but, just trying to put the hopefully fear they're God smart in them. enough that they aren't going right. to do that. I mean, I, I'm scared. <laughs> I mean, I mean, put the fear of God in there. You got to do that. <coughs> I mean, it, it's not like they have a tattoo that says I'm 15. So I mean, you know, yeah. probably knowing are any of these people going to turn 16 in the course of the summer? No. They're all December babies. It's really weird. <laughs> Gee, what happened in March that year? Um, <laughs> no. I tried harassing her and scaring her. Giving her money. She didn't she didn't go for it. I even got her friends in on it. <laughs> I, I do have a, a, another question. I noticed on here you have Ali Modernock put in at four hours at eight seventy five. But for instance, you have Sydney in here with five years of service at eight dollars and fifty cents. Can you kind of address what the discrepancy there is? With Madison, Megan, and Sydney, those are not at our pool. That's why I gave Allie a little higher because those are all our pool. So I kind of gave a little more seniority since she's worked our pool that many. Years. <coughs> I just wanted it clarified. Yeah. <coughs> I would move to approve the lifeguard staff as presented, subject to council review of a of a, a guard handbook mm -hmm. that that we we could see to. Help to knuckle down to help ameliorate some of the the fears of of dealing with the fifteen year olds and out, clearly outlining what their this is necessarily the motion. I mean that, that was the end of the motion. But I mean I, the handbook would clearly outline not only what their times of service would be, but I my understanding is of things like chemicals and some of those kind of things that that they wouldn't be able to do even cl some of the normal cleaning supplies mm -hmm. and some of those types of things that would not... It'd have to also include the corrective action measure if they... Yeah, the correct, right. yeah, correct action. Right. So I guess I would, I would move to hire... Big bold letters, you will be fired. To hire the list of guards as proposed, subject to council review of, right in, of a lifeguard handbook and hopefully maybe at our next meeting even. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I can take that. But would you want the identification of the 15-year-olds in there so that everyone knows who... All the $8 and... Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I mean... I think I that the other guards... Are you talking but names I, listed? I think, I think the handbook itself probably shouldn't include names. If I the, think they know who they are. Okay. But I, I, should, I mean, I think All you of can the do kids it. know each other. <laughs> but you can do it. They know who's what age. But I think that a handbook would be one that would be a policy that you shouldn't have to rewrite it totally every year for no. that. No. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so I mean, you could put an addendum to it saying, yeah, these are sure. the 15-year-olds for your information. No. This is Mrs. Firebait or whatever, but I mean, you know. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? Sandy, you want to call roll? Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McGinty? No. Brenning? Yes. Brenning? Yes. Perry? Yes. And Shakir? So, so that they can't really, because it is subject to our review, they can't really be notified they're hired until we review it. Until they review it. Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I didn't know if it was possible to send that type of recommendation with the letter that you send 15 year olds. Well, I, mean, I guess what I'm saying is they are hired subject to our review of that, yep. so, so they are not hired yet. Yes. Yep. So, no so they won't be hired no until the next council sent. meeting. No. So, yes. so nothing okay. will be sent until, until we have council. reviewed. When you bring your the, handbook. So we've reviewed the handbook. Nothing will be sent to anybody as hired. Okay. Mm. Got it. 
the list, the, the hiring of the list was subject to that. Okay. okay, we'll move on to item number 6C, consideration of hiring temporary full-time laborer one. Adam, if you want to address that. Sure, I'd be happy to. We received <coughs> applications from people who had previously done it, which gives us a great opportunity. We don't have to retrain individuals. Uh, so with that in consideration, I would recommend that we offer the positions to Cameron Marcheski and Tanner Crabb. Cameron worked for us for two summers, I think, but did not do it last year, and Tanner worked for us last year. And they're a good worker, too. Yes. Okay, uh, that'd be at $9 an hour. Sorry. I'll make a motion that we approve Tanner and Cameron. No second. Any further discussion? And we have budgeted for two? Correct. Yes. That's what and, we had previously. And with the start, do we need to do anything about the start time? Or are you going to try and stagger them so we have them? I would rather leave that a little bit open so that I can work with them on their college schedules. Because I know that there's a limit in hours and quarters and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be monitoring that and taking care of that. Okay. Anything else? Sandy, you want to have a roll call? Councilperson Perry? Yes. Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Brenny? Yes. yes. And we'll move on to item 6D, uh, the second reading of ordinance number 2016-275 entitled an ordinance amending the code of ordinances pertaining to chapter 75 all-terrain vehicles <coughs> and snowmobiles i would move adoption of the second reading of ordinance number 2016-275 i'll second it okay i one suggestion I would make under item, uh, let's see, the un unplowed item number, section two, item number one, unplowed streets. Uh, the last of that sentence says, plowed during the snow season and are impractical. You know, I'd, I'd say maybe some wording in there to the effect, travel on these streets is impractical. In other words, just mm -hmm. the term impractical by itself is unclear. Okay, anything else? And we'll call for a vote. Sandy? Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Bruni? Yes. Perry? Yes. Motion mm -hmm. carried. You, you could, uh, well, if you would no, like to consider um, this change in language, because that was not included in right. the motion. I would recommend you wait till a third reading and include it into the language at the yeah. next council meeting. Okay. Because it was not included yeah. in that in that process right there. Because yeah. the motion in second was made before the mm -hmm. uh, proposal was made. Okay. One one other item to it. Um, the publication of each one of these. What what is that run? You'd mentioned that. Yeah. Well, Sandy can probably give you a much clearer picture, or maybe even Dale could. What, what do we typically pay for an ordinance? Uh, uh, I believe the ordinances are like 45 cents a line. Okay. At six point type in our column size. So would you say that 40 to 50 dollars is a fair assessment of that, or? It's just that one that They're might long be high. I bet it's not that long. <coughs> Okay. So the re reason I bring that up is, you know, there's a process of a firm that, that does codification, runs the fee for upgrading all of our codes to be consistent with state law, um, you know, runs about 1000 to $2,000, uh, you know, rather than doing each one of these individually and incurring, you know, the uh, expense of publication and so on maybe have a subcommittee go over all the ordinances, review them, come up with wording, you know, and certainly subject to, you know, council review as well. Uh, maybe doing that as a summary and presenting that, that subcommittee presenting it to the council and then to the uh, codification uh, company to incorporate all that in in one one shot, just yeah. one shot rather than doing it piecemeal. That way you'd have one publication right. cost for the entire 
process. What, just, as it doesn't far as have to go in local papers. It can just it just has to be publicized or what? No, it, I mean it has to. But what they do in those type of cases is they do a publication that says, you know, the city is updating their code book. The code book is on is open for display. They don't actually list out every order. So you'd have that in the paper, and that's yes, it. Yes, and that's it. And save then, a lot of money. Save us a mm -hmm. lot of money. I mean, you pay for the codification, but the the mm -hmm. advantage of the codification is you make sure that it's consistent with state code. Mm -hmm. The weakness of the codification process is is that they, you know, if you have little things like some of the stuff we've been changing here, um, you know, they're not going to change Highway 20 to read Main Street. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of things that you have to deal with on a local level. And so if you would incorporate that in with their changes, uh, <clears throat> you could accomplish both at the same time and only end up paying for one publication cost, mm -hmm. one codification cost, and get all of that work done. Uh, at one time. If we were to develop a subcommittee, is there any committee within the council that that would be most appropriate to if we did that? Um, not really. Right. Okay. Not off the top of my head. I can't think of a committee. Can you, Sandy, think of a committee that I it know, would fall I mean, obviously it would break down because, you know, you've got ordinances that directly affect like utilities and then it would go with individual people that are you know, head of each utility, so you'd really have to break it up. Sure. I'm not saying you couldn't maybe break the ordinance up and have different people look at different sections. Perhaps but establish a committee to look at it, and they could in turn say, all right, so in the area of the police, uh, let the police committee look at that and talk about it with the police people. I mean, but, but establish an oversight committee that's, some of the, that's going to be pretty good at taking notes, figuring out what is there, and... I, I, I would say, you know, like you say, an oversight committee, but probably that oversight committee to go through each yeah. one, rather than, let's say, having another committee go over right. with the police, you know, that... I guess that and would, I, I would that say would that the, delay the focus of the group would not be cold compliance, because that's the purpose of the Iowa, yeah. Iowa codification. They're going to make sure you're code compliant. It would be more on the main street. It would be more on the, the wording, the verbiage. Yeah, mm -hmm. different verbiage. It would want to be more, um, more detailed <coughs> than what the state would be. I mean, right. you know, you want to possibly make it even stricter than what the yeah. code would be. That would be something. That would that would, that would be a money saving thing. That would be a good thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone want to volunteer to serve on the committee, or are we? Let me ask this: Are we in agreement of setting up a subcommittee for this purpose? Yeah. Anyone willing to serve on the committee? I would. Hmm? Yeah. Anyone else? Please not. Should probably of have one. two. Please not a subcommittee of one. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if we could get three, I would be number two, but that way they have an alternate. So you said yes? If the third yeah. person, I would do that if, they, if we have three people on it. We can't do three. Well, Tom and Scott could make three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's what he gets for not being here. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's just say. wrong, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Or, or, I mean, or Adam could be a third member of the committee. I mean, actually yeah, get to vote in the committee? Yeah, that would be scary. Yeah. Now, come on. <laughs> I already wrote down Scott's name. I'd hate to yeah. have to replace it. Oh, that's good. Sorry. Okay, I'll do it for you. <laughs> well, we, should we, let's, let's leave it. Should we ask Scott or is anyone else? Well, we had a volunteer. <laughs> Well, actually, it's neither not Scott nor I count as quorum. No, so, yeah, no. Uh, right. But you can. So it could be a We could both be on there. It could be a four-person committee with Scott and Adam and Tom and me. Yep. There you go. It sounds good. That's it. Yep. <laughs> and if Scott's <laughs> not willing to, to do that, <laughs> we'll reapproach the council. There you Does go. that sound good? Yep. So, are you making that appointment then as mayor pro tem? Uh, pending the acceptance of. 
the mayor. That's up to. I'll let, I'll let that be his call. And if, and if he does not want to do it, then we'll, uh, let's have him bring it back to the council. So I really don't like to make appointments of somebody not who is not here to defend themselves, or him or herself, I should say. So Scott will have to voluntarily go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It's not the way I'll tell it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to item 6E, the second reading of ordinance number 2016-276, entitled an ordinance and <coughs> stop sign at the corner of South 13th and Lee Streets. Any discussion on that? Has there been any input on this at all? From the public? Nope. No. If there's no further discussion, I'll entertain a, a motion to that effect. I'll make the motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Sandy, you want to call a roll? Councilperson Brenny? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Perry? Yes. Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Motion carried. I'm going to waive the third reading of this. Yeah. I, would, I would move to uh, waive the third reading of ordinance number 2016 276. I'll second it. Any discussion on the waiving of the third reading? Nope. If there's no further discussion, call call roll on this, Sandy. Councilperson Mailer? Yes. McGinty? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Brenny? Yes. Perry? Yes. Motion carried. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we'll move on to item 6F discussion on funding for street. Uh, improvement projects, and this is just a discussion. No decision making is going to be taking place. Um, no, Bruce, you had come up with a summary of that. Uh, how do you want to handle it? Do you want to make any comments, or should should I turn it over to? Let him jump right in. Okay, okay Bruce. So in your packets, there's a street financing discussion, and first of all, just if you turn to the um, third page of it. Thankfully, I play piano a little more accurately than I type. Uh, looking at the third bullet point, uh, I thought it should be 1250 instead of 1350 at the uh, second line from the bottom. 1250. It's on page one, three. The third page would, should, read the, should read 1250 instead of 1350. Okay. Um, I really can do math better than that. I just... I, so, what... I guess what this is, is kind of a, a summary of what we have in front of us, which the aging infrastructure, the aging streets, they're a reality. And in some ways, this is, I think personally... Can I inter intervene here? I'm, I'm a latecomer. I see people reading stuff. Do you have an extra one? I believe there was some was sitting over there in the... This is just the um, agenda. I might have one. Tomorrow. I will. Sorry, I made I made a few extras right when they went. Um, I think, you know, and bearing in mind that whatever we do probably is never going to please everybody, I just tried to outline a little bit of what's here. Uh, historically, we've had special assessments, we've had general obligation bonds. We've had farmers getting tax credits for coming in and working on the streets with their horses and their um, <coughs> and their plows. And so the first paragraph is just a little bit of a summary of that. But it seems to me that we have three major questions in front of us. The first is whether we want to use any form of special assessment or go pretty much straight with general obligation bonds. And that's number one on that page. And then, secondly, if special assessments are used, do we want to use this as a percentage to the owners of the, pro the, of the cost of the project or cap it as a percentage of the valuation of their property? There's a state mandate that we can't go over 25% of the assessed value of the property, not taxable, the assessed. So if you have a $100,000 home assessed, you cannot have an assessment more than $25,000. Unless, looking at number three, 
items of direct benefit to you, which would include things like if you get a new sewer line, if you have a driveway put in, those can be assessed directly to the property owner and that's, that has no bearing on the 25% cap. Now there would be some instances with some homes where you might have a higher assessment than actually what the home was worth. <coughs> but those are kind of the three areas we need to look at. If we look at the second page, there's some advantages and disadvantages to each one. I tried to outline them. Sometimes, you know, what may be an advantage to one person is a disadvantage to another person. The general obligation bond fund um, may be the most palatable for the community. Uh, it's easier to administer and it adds no real additional cost to the total project because assessment does, I mean, there is some other cost involved with it. It's virtually litigation proof and aligns with the method that many of the areas cities do use for there, and I think probably most of the cities in the county use that. But disadvantage, it uses more of the city's bonding capacity. It may take longer to pay for a project. There's a greater in ta tax increase for everybody in the community. It may limit the use of special assessments for future projects, and tax-exempt organizations pay nothing for it because they don't pay taxes. The project-based special assessment will spread the cost of the project more equally among property owners. It's perceived as being more equitable, allows for more frequent projects than simply relying on geo bonds. It uses less of the city's bonding capacity, preserves special assessments, and projects can be paid off a bit faster than using general obligation bonds. Disadvantage, it may pose a greater hardship on some property owners who are less able to afford it. I think it's, I put that in there, particularly if you're like, talking about percentage of the project spread out. If you have a $30,000 home, you know, maybe the people don't have quite the income. It, might, it, it may not be quite as equitable that way. Unimproved, underimproved properties will still play less than what would be there because we can't go over the 25% in any case. Properties of lower assessment would have greater difficulty recovering the assessment if they were to sell it. Um, it's hard. It's, if you've got a $30,000 home, it's probably harder to justify that you have a 25% increase by getting a new street in front of your home. Um, assessments are subject to court litigation and review. It could negatively impact the tax-exempt organizations. If you have a church that has a $20,000 assessment, that might be a real major hardship for them to do that. And it maybe isn't politically the most popular choice. I'm not saying that we have to go on what's popular. I'm just laying some stuff out. Um, the property-based assessments may bring in more money than the special assessments if we're going just on the basis of the property. It'd be easier to justify recovery and cost of resale. Allows for more frequent projects, basically the same advantages as the rest of it. One of the disadvantages that may penalize people who have actually improved their projects, their homes. You know, so I mean, so I put in a hundred thousand dollars in my house. Why should I have to pay more for the street than the person next to me? Um, it may be perceived as being inequitable. Unimproved properties pay very little, but basically this is the same thing that would happen either case because of the twenty-five percent state cap. Um, like any assessment, it could be subject to court review. Could negatively impact tax exempt organizations, and it's not necessarily the most popular. The numbers of interest. If we go to the next page. Um, basically, any special assessment that brings in less than $100,000, we might as well forget it. Because that's, you know, it, it kind of takes about that amount of money to get to, 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 to determine it, to administer it. Um, the last street project that failed had about $800,000 of assessment dollars that was, were built into it at the 25% level. Um, if special assessments are based solely on property values, based on the current property tax rates that we have right now, which is 38515 per thousand, and that's, that includes all the countywide taxes, each 1% of property value that we would base this on. So what I'm saying is if we had a $100,000 house, you would be, have $1,000 that you would contribute to an assessment. Yeah. That actually will increase the property taxes about 5% for 10 years if you're looking at a 10-year repayment back for that. And that's pretty constant. What, that, I mean, that is totally constant. So, so if your property taxes were $1,000 a year with just the assessment, it would be $1,250 a year. The $2,000 a year would be $2,500 a year. I mean, that's just, 
And that did not figure any interest into there because the last proposal did have people paying interest if they spread their assessment over the 10-year period. Um, and the project percentage based on the tax of uh, the uh, of the uh, percentage of the project would have a this is kind of a similar thing. Uh, kind of as a point of reforma uh, reformation, sorry, information. Um, for every hundred thousand dollars of general obligation bond that the city assumes, bearing in mind that the projects would include perhaps some utility dollars that would be there because if we're redoing sewers, if we're redoing gas, water, some of those would come not so much out of a geo bond, but they would come through a different source. They would come through the utilities. The based at a 3.5% interest rate and a 10-year payback, and I think that's maybe a little overreaching in the interest rate. I see that Fort Dodge just got a 1.17 interest rate. So that, but $28 a thousand would be the increase for every $100,000 of bonding. So if you bond for, um, if you bond for a million dollars, it would be $2.80 a thousand. That would be the increase to every property owner in the community. And if you're looking at assessments and that, the people who are assessed would have their increase in taxes to pay back the general obligation bonds and the assessment. So, I mean, they're, they're getting double whammy. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying anything. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just throwing out. I'm not. I don't even know where I sit on this for sure. The Flint formula, which I know last time was something that people didn't even want to hear about, but it is the only really method that has been used in court and held up to determine percentage of value for the project. And it's basically based on the amount of frontage you have for the property and how far you are away from it. It's a logarithmic function that, so an uh, example where I live, part of my property is within ha half a block of 9th Street. So I was being assessed for what was happening on 9th Street, but it wasn't a whole lot of money because I'm quite a ways away from there. Now, 8th Street was one of those there, and I have bought it. So that, that was a heftier assessment because I was closer to it. But any assessment, we would have to determine what the potential value is for that particular property to do it because you can't assess more than what the perceived value is. I mean, we could say we're going to assess 25% of the property's value, but if that doesn't have that benefit, we can't do it anyway. All we're setting is a maximum. And um, based on the last proposed project, a property-based assessment, which I believe that one was, of three to four percent would be needed to meet the hundred thousand minimum threshold. And and finally, I mean, it's kind of a point of interest. A street project, if we're bonding, we could recover some in the general fund by repaying some of the engineering fees that were done last time that would still be applicable. And then there's one sentence on here that I just didn't get to read it as I went to the next page. The last page is just kind of a flow chart. My brain operates maybe differently than other people's, but it kind of lists what our questions are. Will we use special <coughs> assessments? If no, we're kind of done. If yes, we need to go on and say, will they be based on a percentage of the property or percentage of property or project or property value? And they're kind of outlined there. And then finally at the bottom, will the items of direct benefit to the property owners be assessed to the property, sidewalks, utilities, driveway, et cetera. It seems that before we can really mount a street project, those maybe seem to be the questions that we need to address. And I tried to present just, just a packet of kind of information without saying, I support this, I don't support this, whatever's there. It was some information that I found helpful, at least <coughs> as I was looking at the looking at the situation, trying to figure out where to go, and um, not trying to be pushy, but sometimes sometimes my brain my brain needs some things on paper and some numbers that are there before I you know, come up with even knowing where to stand. And I've talked too much, but that I guess that's what's in front of you at this point. You know, I think, too, we have to look at, you know, what project are we going to approach? Are we going to try the same, uh, you know, project as we did the last time? Personally, I think if we're going to redo a street, we need to address the uh, infrastructure underneath it, such as the you know, sewers and so on. Uh, just addressing the surface 
what's up above <clears throat> really doesn't address the overall problem. In fact, some of our backup and our sewers in the Ninth Street, you know, area uh, were as a result of some of the infrastructure under, underneath, you know, the ground there. So that's a consideration. Another thing we should look at too uh, is the Ninth Street or the excuse me, the North Fifth Street bridge across the Raccoon River. Uh, some of the deck, it's is the, the cement is eroding away, you know, small potholes there. And from what my understanding is, <clears throat> now help me with this, Adam. If that once that deck goes, then the infiltration of water into the steel within the bridge starts to deteriorate. And what might have been a let's say a hundred thousand dollar estimate of be, be about eighty thousand, eighty thousand to, to fix the deck versus three to four hundred thousand. If we start talking about tearing the bridge out and doing you know steel infrastructure. Uh, wasn't that's a farm to market road are we, we not discussing with yes in fact one of the things I was going to make a comment to, to <clears throat> kind of adding to Bill's statements is is that two locations that I think the street and alley committee it's kind of sitting and hold to be a part of this discussion once the financing arm is put into place will be the inclusion of South Fifth Street and the North Fifth Street Bridge as potential also add-ins uh, to a planned project. Whether that means we're taking other things out, putting that in, I can't. That's for the committee to decide. But I can tell you that the committee will hear from Tom Crabb on both of those locations. We um, are supposed to receive some numbers from the county engineer associated with South Fifth Street. I'm waiting for those numbers along with the breakdown of uh, responsibility between the parties before I start talking to them about North Fifth Street Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and that we should be getting some state money for. Correct. I was going to say because we're a detour too. So Correct. Yeah. So I mean, I think, I guess, my hope would be that we could come up with a method of financing street projects, maybe kind of moving forward, and then and then determine the scope of the projects after we come up with financing that. I know that's a little backwards, but I mean, that would be my hope that we could uh, solve, do, do that first hurdle and then and then go to, if I'm gonna buy a car, I kinda know what I want to, what money I've got there to spend. And I think, uh, Teresa, I know Teresa and I are the Street and Alley Committee, I think maybe if we have an idea of kind of the, the funding that is available, that it's easier to say, well, we think we can do six blocks or we can do 30 blocks you know I mean you know, yeah. I mean that's a and and with what kind of repetitiveness we can do it I mean though I think those are kind of things and kind of coming up with a maybe a longer range plan for infrastructure and so well, I think that's a great idea because I think we need to be up front with to. the financing and so people are aware instead mm -hmm. of having it as the last thing that we did and everybody is, you know, is really upset. I mean, it, mm -hmm. at least have it up front and have everybody have an opportunity to discuss it in, you know, whichever way. I think that's the proper way to go myself. And that was the last thing that was said last time that, um, if you could look back in the minutes, that before anything else was brought up again, it was going to be determined and passed by resolution as to how we, city as a whole is going to move forward with special assessments. Mm -hmm. Now, now, once we get through the steps on Bruce's uh, discussion here, which I think is laid out in the way that we need to move, I think the next step past this point is then we get into the discussion about talking about if we do special assessment, would be the number, it would be, okay, well, we're going to do property. Well, we've talked about percentages before. Well, what percentage would that be? Because I can tell you in just a little test of a bill and I did this week, 5% of the property value compared to 5% of the project cost are very different very, numbers. Very different. Mm -hmm. And so once we get past the stages of Bruce's discussion here, <clears throat> then I can start to put numbers on paper to give you an idea so you guys can have some kind of thought in mind as far as where you want to set the percentage. <coughs> uh, but to set the percentage before knowing which method you want to move forward on. Do you um, remember any of those numbers or not? Um, well, uh, I think Bill, uh, we understand this was a very generic right, right. test we were doing. But I believe when we use the two different methods, a $100,000 home under one method at 5% 
was and a hundred thousand dollar home after five percent of the other one was the difference in uh, uh, paying a full twenty five thousand dollars and paying five thousand dollars. It was a twenty thousand dollar difference in the special assessment. That's how big the was that not the case, right. Bill? Was when we on a one hundred thousand dollar home <clears throat> under the. Uh, Let's see, the uh, project limited to 5% of the project was, uh, five, let's see, that, that was the 5,000, or no, that, <clears throat> that was the 25,000 one, versus the, based on 5% of the assessed value, then the lower cost $100,000 home paid 5,000. On the other hand, a very highly... Uh, a million dollar home. A million dollar home would on the one hand pay, uh, let's say... I think it was 250000 either way. Right. I don't think it made a bit of difference. Well, but yeah. bearing in mind that we have to go back and use the Flint method or something to and, demonstrate what... And there's an assumption built into this about the Flint method. I mean, that's why I, I really want to preface this by saying... We have so many moving pieces right now, it's hard to do a model yeah. like this. But if we can kind of shore down the issues on Bruce's sheet here, it gets a lot easier for me to hammer down some of the variables so you know. Um, I, I can tell you just based upon the variables we ran, I'd rather pay 10% of my value than 5% of the uh, project cost. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it, it, it's less, it's a higher percent, but it's less money when you pan it all out. And that, I mean, I guess, but I mean, we can't assess more than what the determined value of the project would be through the Flint method, somebody else. And, um, and we made a determination, I believe, of comparable Flint method. I think that was a, a constant mm -hmm. in our in ours is what the Flint method uh, result was. But there's no grants or anything out there that we can apply for. Um, uh, what we would likely have better it. luck with, Teresa, mm -hmm. when it comes to street projects. I mean, RISE grants are the ones things that always come up, but this isn't going to qualify for a RISE grant. A RISE grant is for job development, and you have to have proven jobs against it in order to qualify. I mean, we're not going, I mean, you're not going to be able to sell this. That's usually only allowed in the terms of, we're building a new business. It's going to create 10 more jobs. You're going to build a road to supply to this business, and you get a rise grant for that road. The state so, will come in and help you with a rise grant. So, for grant example, if we were to do a road to the industrial part. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, Lakeview, for instance, got a rise grant associated with the building of the hotel mm -hmm. because it created so many jobs, mm -hmm. um, just to give you an example. The uh, the probably the e the more likely route for us to be able to entertain will be controlling the interest rates, because when we just started the discussion back in 2012, the expectation of the interest rate, if I remember right, and Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, we were thinking like five and a half percent, and I I don't think there's any question today we could do better than the five and a half percent. But, uh, and in fact, we could probably do significantly better than the 5.5%. But there's an example of a place where I think there's a better opportunity for money savings than getting a grant. They, I'll be just real honest with you. I know a lot of people think grants are the answer to everything. But in the case of street projects, I can get hundreds of thousands of dollars for an airport. But you'd be lucky to get a dime for a street. Don't make sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah, I know. You know, Bruce and I attended a, a grantsmanship seminar out at the Iowa State Extension about a week ago. You know, and there were a number of different sources that you could Google and, and run a query on them. Uh, did, you, did you pick anything up that might fit into this? Well, I, I talked to the presenter afterwards. I said, so do you have any idea, any good insights for like infrastructure repair and she laughed yeah and said stand in line everybody else wants the same thing 
And, right. and I think that's what the crazy scenario we've got in place. Everybody knows it's the white elephant in the room. It's the place where we need grant money the most. And it's, but the need is so high that anything they would put in place is a drop in the bucket. I mean, like, for instance, this gas tax. This gas tax, what cities got out of this gas tax, most cities, was a drop in the bucket to what you need to dealing with your issues. You get, what, 32000 30, Yeah, a little over $30,000 a year. That would pave a, a one side of one block once every 10 years. I mean, it's if you didn't spend it on anything else. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't do anything. And, well, it uh, does. It does thirty thousand dollars worth, but it, uh, okay. <laughs> thirty thousand dollars isn't a lot anymore. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a lot if it's in your checking account, but it's not a lot if you're doing a street. <laughs> yeah, you know. and uh, you know the an uh, an alternative that was discussed uh, last time, and it was abandoned after the discussion was uh, there was a discussion about create going taking to the people a vote to create a capital improvement um, taxation. The problem with the capital improvement taxation is is it's capped by the state on what you can collect on that. And for our collection, the maximum amount that could be approved and collected is about thirty thousand dollars a year, which we're back to that thirty thousand dollar number again. Uh, it, uh, uh, but that would just be. Honestly, that would be no different than a general obligation, to be all honest. All you're doing is passing it on to your taxpayers once again. So it's no different than a, than a taxing activity. In fact, I would argue general obligation is probably more advantageous in that process than the capital process. You know, another thing to consider, too, you know, if, if we were doing a $3 million bonding and it's come up that it would take probably seven years for us to do another major project if we don't use special assessment in what 3.5 years or something. I, I want to get just, a, I want to get away from that a little bit Bill okay. simply because those are based on old numbers okay. and it, and um, I don't think it's fair to start to con I'm, I'm guilty of that in fact I think I told a couple of the council members of that I've been guilty of been of using those numbers but those numbers are based upon 2012 13 information and there and it's it, it's not accurate I can't give you accurate numbers until we start putting we get much more shored up on the financing side about what we'd be looking at but I would say it it would be somewhere consistent with that I would say that uh, I wouldn't say those would have changed significantly, but they would have probably changed at this point. And it also, I mean, if we add on the bridge and we add on South Fifth Street, and the city takes on a significant portion of that cost, and um, we don't take things out, or we change also include Ninth Street as a total replacement, and we do this all as general obligation, I would say ten years probably wouldn't be. A, a safe number then because we're putting quite an additional amount of money into the project. So, uh, and that's pure speculation on my part. Ten years you'll have more streets and more infrastructure falling apart if you wait right. that long. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that, can't do that. I guess my hope is that we can come up with something that is a, a combination but with a very moderate, moderate assessment that would help with a little bit of the repetitive nature and yet perhaps not I mean I know personally the last project my property taxes would have more than tripled and at, at the maximum amounts correct well I mean at the E even without the maximum amount, because depending on what was there, I mean, if you want, if you want half, half of the maximum amount, depending on what was there, because the less that you did that, the more that you were doing general obligation bonds. So then the higher that the, the, higher that the repayment would have been for everybody. Mm. So, I mean, and I think that, I mean, those that are in the assessed area, we, if we look at the figures, we are in an economically repressed area. I mean, I know that most of us probably 
I, w I wish I were a little more food challenged. I might not have this body shape. But we have a number of people in the community who are significantly, they don't know for sure even where the next meal is coming from. And I think to, I mean, I hate to, un to, unbur to burden them to the point that they can't even afford to live here. And I'm afraid that, I mean, going from $100 a month to $300 a month in property taxes, that, that can become really, really significant in a special, you know. And that, I think, would be, I, I would, I guess the humanitarian side of me would have a really hard time supporting, supporting that. Now, having some form of assessment that was much more moderate than that, and I think maybe my personal preference would be to do a very moderate assessment that was uh, property value based more than percentage of the project based. Now that would be my personal preference, but um, for, for property based versus okay, property based mm -hmm. versus project. Based. Mm -hmm. That would be my personal. That would be my personal preference. But I mean. Well, my personal preference would be able to fix all the streets and not have to raise taxes. <laughs> and, you know, just, just have someone come in with, with their, you know, the bewitched lady come in, wiggle her yeah. nose, and we have all brand new streets. But that proposal would reduce the obligation bonds to a percentage where we might be able to do something in a shorter amount of time. Right. 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 So, I mean, so it might, so if, it might, because the <clears throat> money that we take for special assessments doesn't count against our bonding capacity, even though we would do general obligation bonds on it. Because it's a different fund source. So we would do a general obligation bond. So if we said we were going to bond for, let's say, $300,000 of the project, that would be $300,000 less that we would be taking away from the, I mean, assessed for $300,000, that would be $300,000 we'd be taking away from the general obligation bond portion of it. So it would let it come back a little more quickly and I guess it probably depends on your definition of a major project. If we did something two and a half million, maybe coming back in four years, able to do another million worth, you know, maybe, you know, they, you know and, and kind of doing the math on that. And as Adam says, it's hard to, you know, there's so many moving pieces that are floating around in this that it's really hard to get an idea of, it's sort of like looking at a kaleidoscope and wondering exactly where, what's going to fall next. How much was the last project that we looked at? I believe once we got the bids in and with all the other fees associated with it, we were looking in the neighborhood of about two and a half million dollars. Uh, on the last one? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. Steve. I don't know if this is for citizens speak, but I'm going to interject. I'm kind of the elephant in the room. Everybody knows me from the last one. I didn't miss one. You really pissed me off, and Mr. Hansen. Well, we'll use. Uh, but, uh, we'll use. Me. Let, let me interrupt you. Uh, we won't use those terms in the discussion here. It's going to be a civil discussion. But, they'll, but they'll, my they'll, point they'll, being why I want to interject, so you quit wondering why I'm here. We've had a lot of this. How do we pay for it? Discussion involving more than just me. It involved that whole room being packed. This whole room being packed. You had letters. You had phone calls, you had current council members that were on the other side of the coin. And so I'm just saying, keep all of what happened last time. Not just how did we plan on spending more money, but remember how it affected a large part of the town. And I will agree with you that the town is not growing. Most of us, if you look at the downtown, we've all turned 65 and we retired. I was lucky enough, I got a young man to take over what my business was. Some of the others aren't going to be so lucky. Hopefully they will. Nobody can see the future. But if you're going to start spending in the future, start remembering that the town's getting older, and those of us that quit working saw our salaries drop 60 or 70 percent. So when you come up and you say, well, it's only 25 percent of this or that, well, I'm down 70% of what I used to make. So I don't just, I just paying for a, a sewer, uh, the school doesn't even ask you. So I really don't want to use all my good arguments, but they just do it. 
here's your 28 cents times 1,000, whatever. The school just does it. If you need more garbage, you raise the garbage. You raise the yellow tags. You do this and that, people just bump along and you get with it. But if you start handing out sheets that say, burn 700 Platt Street, you're going to owe us $17,750 because that garbage dump you got in the backyard is a big yard and the law says we can do this to you. Pardon me for taking care of my house for one thing, as was brought up earlier. Pardon me for having a garbage dump that goes deeper into my backyard than most people's backyards. I will thank you for getting my piece of cement in my driveway fixed. <coughs> Because I did complain about that last year. <coughs> 20 years to get that thing fixed. I now have that fixed, so thank you. But I am right on the cusp. If you go look at all your phone-ins, that you can go back two Sundays ago, and I'll put in a pat on the back for Tom and Jason. My sewer backed up, which it does quite often. And uh, anyway, it was a Sunday. I couldn't wait till Monday. <clears throat> Tom got a hold of Jason. He he took care of the problem. Wonderful. And and as he as he's watching it, I mean, we had backed up. I can't tell you how far. And uh, he says, you know, you must have a flat spot here. Well, so I'm one of those that really wants this sewer thing. I, I have paid for more rotor rooter than most. That's three minutes. Oh. And, uh, okay. <clears throat> whatever. So I, but I did not appreciate getting handed a bill for 18000 just because of where I lived. When everybody drives on the street, everybody's poop goes down the toilet, it goes somewhere. And it's no different than everybody goes to school, everybody uses the water treatment plant. You know, spread it out through the town because we're, I don't care if I don't drive on North 5th or whatever, but we all drive on something. So fix them, spread it out for all of us at 28 cents or whatever. Slow down your spending because we're not making any more money here unless you see something on the future and quit getting us all in debt and worrying about how to spend more of it. Some of us would like to Steve, I'm, I'm gonna, save some money. I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, we, we tried to limp. You were a little bit late coming to the meeting. Yeah. But anyway, just remember what all went through here a year ago. Good. And it wasn't a happy time. Yep. Thank you for, for your comments. The last time the, we talked about the project, it was, or the streets, it was done by figuring percentage of the project, right? No, it was a percentage of the property. What was sent to the uh, residents? And this was on the advice of both uh, the architects and the attorneys involved with the project, is that in your initial report that you send to the homeowners, you cannot exceed what you include in your initial report. So what was included in the initial report was, uh, barring the Flint um, calculations, was the maximum evaluation that a property could be assessed as part of the process. So it was the 25%? Barring the Flint. The Correct. You got to include the assessed value. Correct. Correct. Is there any possible feasible way, and I'm just asking this because that's what Doc just said, but... Um, there's no way other than doing the, um, just for my clarification, the, um, the vote to the people to tax everybody, right? Yeah, the general obligation bond. Would, the GO would tax everybody. The GO bond would, would affect everybody's property tax. Correct. It, whatever portion is put into general obligation, and general obligations would be included either way. Right. Whatever portion is being included into general obligation would be assessed to all properties except your non-taxing bodies. Your churches, your city, your school, your county, your post office, your uh, any entity that doesn't pay property taxes would be exempt 
from being included in the assessment, and that would build on the deficiencies of the of the project. Okay. Any other discussion? What what did what should be our next step? Do you think? At some point, we have to answer, one, are we going to include special assessment as a portion of it, and as Bruce has pointed out here, and two, if we are going to, initially we need to come up with a conclusion on whether or not that's going to be property or project driven. And once we can do that, then I can start putting pen to paper and start giving you numbers so you guys can then work out a percentage of whichever of those versions you want to work, move forward with. And at that point, it's all subject to change. It's just for informational purposes to make our best decision. Correct. Well, once you would have your percentage determined, yes. we'll do a resolution basically saying that the council has agreed that moving forward with street projects, this is how we're going. This is the model we're going to use to pay for them. Then after that, that gives the street and alley committee what they're asking for, which is how we're going to pay for it, so they can then determine what they are going to propose to be a part of the street project. Okay. Do we want to set any timeline on that, or what? I personally feel that no decision we make is going to be popular. No, be, but I think the one decision we will make that will be the least popular is doing nothing, because our aging infrastructure is exactly that. It's aging, and it's not getting any younger, like many of the rest of us. And I think that it's easy for us to procrastinate. It's easy for us to avoid making a decision, but I think to avoid making a decision is also making a decision, which is that we're doing nothing. And I guess I would hope that we could come up with something so that we can actually begin to propose a project and hopefully get some things moving forward so we don't have things like a $300,000 bridge replacement instead of an $80,000 cap. And that, you know, and that we can maybe tie some of these things together. And I would love to see us be able to do something even maybe late fall. I mean, you know, something, you know, something so that we don't have, so that we can say, look, we have accomplished this. I mean, I, I, as far as the time frame goes, I'm not saying, I, I hate the vacuum cleaner salesman, you have to decide this today. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think. I, I think perhaps just a timeline on when we're going to come to the decisions as to, you know, whether it's going to be project or property based, whether or not we're going to use assessment, that would be the next logical step, wouldn't it? Yes. And I then, mean, Bruce then, did a very good job of pointing out what the, what, what the initial steps we need to make. Right. What is in front of us right now? Well, I have to agree with Bruce. I would prefer property based assessment. I mean, that would just be my preference. That'd be the least. That would be the least. least. We have yes. to count. Yeah, we have Friend, to compromise with people. Be more we friendly can't. with the public. Yes, nothing like Bruce said. Nothing's going to be popular with them. Right. You can't please everybody. It's just life. But we do have to do something with our streets and our infrastructure. That Whether we have actually that would be cheaper than going the percentage of the project. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. On a, if we're comparing five percent to five percent. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, okay. It is, uh, uh, that's, of course, something I can set down and, uh, I mean, once you guys have kind of given me direction, I can start to tell you whether or not 5% makes sense, whether or not 7%, right. whether you take 5 or 10 5% of a $100,000 property is a lot less than 5% of a, say, a $6 million project. project. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the... Property based will favor the lower cost mm -hmm. or, or evaluated house. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as the percentage goes, what once I can come back to you with some percentage ideas, you can then let me, then you can kind of get an idea of what's too little, what goes mm -hmm. below the threshold of what is financially feasible to do, and what is in your view beyond what you want to do as far as a direct burden. 
So I think. Well, we, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Bill. So I'll I think it was going to cost just a hundred thousand just to float the assessment portion. Is that? There was the filling was is anything under a hundred thousand? Probably uh, seventy seventy five thousand of it, you know. Yeah. I guess. I guess what? Yeah, those were the numbers we were. The, the, sen the sense that I got, it, it, there's no point in doing a seventy thousand dollar assessment if it right. adds seventy thousand to the project. Well, a hundred thousand was the minimum of an assessment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Assessment. That's I, I, reasonable. I think. I think I outlined that in here. I yeah. Yeah. But did it state the cost of doing the assessment for a hundred thousand? No, 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 because you and I did that as right. a model discussion. Bruce and I never went over right. those numbers okay. as yeah. a model. I, this this took place after. Um, and this this was you. this was me sitting at home one night, started typing, going, "Okay, what, what, what's happening? What do I think?" And um, then making you have to read it. Sorry, but um, so is there a consensus that maybe we would like Adam to look at some? I'm property? hearing yes in property. <laughs> maybe, yeah, for a, for some property assessment, would that be a consensus among the council? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it'd be more acceptable. Mm -hmm. From the community mm -hmm. and then from the last time you guys did them letters that was the most you could assess that you sent out correct yes. the under the way it was proposed to us is, is that whatever you send to somebody in an initial letter mm -hmm. is the most they can be assessed yeah. so if the ch cost of the project was to change significantly throughout the project um, you would be bound, your assessment would be bound by what your original letter said. Yeah. So is there a recommendation that the letter be sent with the maximum potential amount included? You couldn't, you couldn't say, you like say, so what the $75,000 home is, you got to, well say the assessment is, what, four or 5000 mm -hmm. Say if, that's what they can be taxed, but this is what we're going to assess you at, they like say 5% of that. It would be very difficult to put variables in a letter. Yeah. Well, and the feelings of the attorney was yeah. is that you're Believe creating that doubt. Yeah. You're creating doubt on whether or not they could challenge whether or not that you were creating doubt and whether or not that was potential of an assessment or not. Yeah, but I think the, it should be known on what this is based on, though, that it can't right. fluctuate. That yeah, because truly, honestly, you're not going to know what the costs are right. until you get the uh, good yeah. cost is going to be until you get the bid in. And engineers and, are always going to guesstimate high, high on your bid. High. Yeah. Hopefully, real high. I, I don't remember going. exactly, so don't quote me on this, but I think we got farther and far enough along in our project last time that we had figured that the assessments were going to end up being in the neighborhood of about 70% in most cases of what was sent to the homeowners. So if you were sent one saying your assessment was going to be $10,000, generically I can tell you we were thinking internally it was actually going to end up being around $7,000. Yeah. But that was based upon what we knew our engineering, what cost was going to be, we knew what our bonding cost was going to be, and we knew what our, um, we had a bid in from our, contractor. Uh, from a contractor. Yeah. So, but the problem is, by the time you have all that in, the letters had to have been sent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, six, and, you know, four months in advance. And, and, and so here, here's, that, and this is what, what hurt, you know, this time. is what made it so difficult the last time. And those letters go out and somebody sees that maximum value. Yeah. That's all of a sudden mm -hmm. is what it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and education didn't make any difference uh, in terms of how it was looked at. That's why I was wondering if maybe if it could, how you word it ain't going to make no difference. You're going to see that top dollar and that's what we're going to have to pay instead of, this could cost you up to this amount. And actually, they don't see them words. And actually, we the red letter was written by the attorneys. Yeah. We didn't put any pen to paper okay. on it. Um, this is a process that is has so much opportunity for litigation yeah. that you hand it over to those who know how to do the process. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it's so costly. That's why we talk about the seventy-five thousand dollars to do this because you've got to bring those attorneys in and they basically between the engineers and the attorneys they guide you through the entire process they draft everything you know our we manage it we monitor it the biggest challenge for us in the office 
was putting the names together, the contact numbers together. I mean, all of the mailing lists together. I mean, that was probably the biggest challenge to us in the initial stages. Then to review what they had done to make sure that there was accuracy within the uh, methods mm -hmm. that the, because the Flint method, of course, is based on improvement. Well, you got to review where they say water lines are, where they say sewer lines are, and things of that nature, and make sure that's all accurate. So there was a lot of internal responsibility throughout the f initial stages of the project. I don't know where I was going with that. So I guess no, it's good. Well, <laughs> I guess I'm new. I you know I sure a few questions there. So, Adam, could you come back with some at least maybe a, a, a next step? Sure. What I will do next with this type of consideration in place. I will take generic home concepts, a home of 50,000, a home of 100,000, and a home of 200,000. And I will, um, and I will, of course, the one constant game I've got to play is the Flint Method because I can't, I, I'll, I'll have to create a constant for the Flint Method because each property would have a different improvement level on it, and I'm not going to know that. But I can at least say, okay, well, their improvement level at each house was constantly this. Here's the value of a 50000 a 100000 and a, and a $200,000 home. And based on that, here's what a 5% assessment of property value would be, a 7.5%, and a 10% would be. And we can't and, go any lower than 5 I, I just use that. Honestly, Teresa, what will dictate that is when I do that and we start to have some kind of ideas of what 100000 would be. If 5% doesn't, doesn't look like it would come up to 100000 based upon the size of the project, then 5%. Right. Uh, well, it depends on the size of the project and the area mm -hmm. where your yeah. project well, is. Well, once again, the, so the variables, there are right. so many variables here. We've, right. we, we're closing some of them down, but there is still a massive right. amount of vari variables to putting an idea together. Right. Well, that'll at least give us an idea of numbers and figures and what we're looking at then. Right. Mm -hmm. You'll have an idea of what a $100,000 home, how it would be impacted by this. Yeah, yeah Steve. Could you, you talk about we're delaying this, so we've got to pay it faster, and isn't it? And again, it's a variable. But could you decide what all of your projects are, and then say, rough guessing costs, say, if we had blah, 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 how much money do we need? How big a pile of money? And how it, because, and I know you asked for the opposite, but... For those of us that are sitting here pondering, well, are they going to do a $1 million project? Are they going to do a $2 million? What are they holding off? Are we holding off $10 million? Or are we holding off $3.8 million? And if you could at least give us caps, rough caps. Nobody's holding anybody to the, to the grindstone. But Well, I think, I mean... But, you know, if you keep saying, well, we're delaying projects, well, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. I'm going to say I'm delaying the weather. That doesn't tell you anything. I think what are your projects roughly? Is it Ninth Street? Is it Platt Street? Is it, you know, none of us want to lose a bridge. I walk that South Fifth nearly every day, so yeah, it needs to be fixed. My sewer backs up twice a year, so yeah, I'd like that. But is there something down at your part of town? Is there something at your Hard to town. I don't know, but, but if you could be a little more upfront, and I'll be honest with you, that's what the presidents are going through. Nobody trusts government anymore because they always have this stuff that they're working on. From a street standpoint, an assessment Tom and I did, uh, Tom uh, Crab and I did, we could not do our street needs with twenty million dollars. Twenty million. Yes. And, we and could that, not do our street needs with twenty million dollars, and, and our bonding capacity is about three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to choose and pick, and realize that once we choose the project that we're going to, we know that we cannot three, proceed any further three for quite million, some time. Does three and a half million get you your worstest spots? Based upon uh, yeah, but then it's not going to get us anything in the future. 
if we use our whole, years. like 10 more years, and then what in 10 years? Well, I guess to answer your question. Yeah, that's the only thing about doing that. The need, <clears throat> the last major street project we did would have been 20 some years ago, something like that, in some of the residential areas up by the Catholic Church, some of that area. But probably realistically, by the time we would get everything else replaced, that will need replacing too. Mm -hmm. Well, my street was one of those, and it, and it didn't work. Good. I think that's why my sewer doesn't work, is because of what they do. So, of it. But uh, anyway, but I I'm think just curious what the the, the, the size of what the potential the project is greater than what we can undertake at one. And the twenty million is just roads. That's not even talking about the sewer lines, the water lines, or any of that underneath it. The infrastructure. It. Uh, the infrastructure. Uh, this is a. We can get into a long conversation, but yeah, this is a major national. Flint, Michigan was there. This is a major national problem. Many of our older communities are sitting on hundred-year-old sewer systems. Um, think uh, well. Look at Flint and their water system. I mean, mm -hmm. there are needs. We have. We went, we went through genera a generation of overbuilding our needs. And unfortunately, what that means is, is when you move into a shrinking society state, you run into a scenario where you no longer have the resources to maintain those means. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why sometimes if you've listened to the council meetings, you've heard me say, we city shouldn't take on property, we should be trying to shed property. <laughs> I, I, one of, I'm an advocate for us doing anything we can to reduce our maintenance liability moving forward because unfortunately I think I hope most people see the coming storm and the coming storm scares me to death mm -hmm. because not just in this community but throughout communities older communities in our nation because we've got to address these problems and there isn't the money there to address them well that project last year in the didn't play and I realize it's not Two million versus twenty, so it's ten percent. But how much of our worst stuff would that have covered? The filling, the filling based on the JEO report was that was the basis of how we determined what streets. Right. There was a report done by JEO. God, that seems like that was forever ago now. Which is an engineering firm. Yes, in I'm sorry. They came in. They did an <clears throat> analysis of the state of our streets, and we took that report. Uh, and we said, okay, based on the report, these are the streets that need the work the most. And so these are the ones, that's how we're going to determine what streets we target. We're not going to base it upon where a council member lives or where a city employee lives. We're going to base it on what an engineering firm we paid money to come in here and do tells us. So that's what it was based on. And um, since then, of course, we have all seen what's going on with South Fifth Street and of course bridges are a whole nother ball game right. you, you know a street goes bad you deal with tens of thousands of dollars a bridge goes bad you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars right. so they tend to take a priority immediately when they have a need luckily we basically have one bridge of concern our other two bridges have been replaced in relatively recent history and that one is the one in need. So that's where South Fifth Street comes into the discussion as being a new need that was kind of, there was a next step in the JEO um, analysis that included South Fifth Street uh, as one of the streets included in that JEO report at the next level. The fact of the matter is we had to make a cut somewhere in the JEO report and say, okay, anything that graded less than this. Yeah. I, I, right. And so the. But you could take South Fifth out of current discussion and, and flip that over to the bridge? Uh, we could, yes, we could do one, we could do both, and I could tell you that our maintenance superintendent will be encouraged us to including both into the project. Oh, yeah. Well, we all want both. So it doesn't yeah. make it <laughs> much longer. But we need a bridge more than we need a road. Well, uh, I, yeah. I can drive down gravel yeah. better than I can water. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, kind of, it's a triage system. You have to look at it and see <coughs> which ones can we save, which ones are we going to let. You know, I mean, oh, Saints, Which one's going to save savables first? and sinners. <laughs> I would just soon not have to lose. As you can see, I'm still mad a year later to get a bill for. And I don't care if you did come in less. There was a lot of arrogance last year. That man, that, the engineering man, that said this has been through the courts. 
You know how much that with 10 cents is going to get you towards a cup of coffee? Not much. I don't like arrogance. I'm not stupid. I got eight years of college. I got 35 years of work. Talk to me like I know what I'm talking about. And don't give me this, you can sue me crap. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for answers. We agree. That's, that's what we're trying to get. Yeah. But I'm just saying, remember the anger that went last year. So I, I will be so happy. It was actually three years ago. Three, three years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will. Uh, start drafting up some information going with different percentages uh, using the property method then. And okay. when are we going to determine what we're going to attack? Uh, well, once the percentage, once the, once the, you guys come to a determination on what you want me to draft up in a percentage to include in a resolution, once they know what's going to be in the resolution, then the real work of the Street and Alley Committee can make it. <laughs> Teresa and I will become even better friends. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Not just because of you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. Do we have anything else before we adjourn? Water tower? Oh, oh he just wanted you guys to oh, see. Oh, just wanted us to see it. Yep. Well, you, you might, it's going to be neat. You, you might be uh, bring up the, you know, we're getting a good value here. On top of that, I, I looked at it as a little vic victory when yeah, I, was I, I wasn't going to share this. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. But uh, and Jim, Jim got a call from the water company saying, oh, well, it's going to cost an additional, I believe it was about $12,000 more. And I told you, the quote I sent you is just for putting the logos on. It's not for also putting Sac City on there. You're going to have to pay for that separate, too, because that's a new silk, too. Because it was a different design than the old Sac City. Uh, that was on there too because we're not only changing the logos yeah. we're also changing mm -hmm. the way Sex City yeah. was written yeah. and colored and so it's going to cost you an extra $12,000 and I will say Jim went to fight for us and um, pointed out that they're a year behind on doing it and um, so they had committed to honor their initial pricing and include all four paintings in it well, good. and so, including the Sex City good. as well so Jim deserves some credit yeah. for good. his work on yeah. that yeah without a doubt Uh, you still have public input on solid waste and council forum before you can adjourn. Right. Any information on Movement public input on solid waste? Well, none on solid solid waste. We'll move on to council forum. Is there anything else that anyone wants to address there? I just <laughs> let you know um, if you call me and I don't return your message tomorrow or the next day. We have the Iowa Utility Board in here doing our gas audit. And then next Tuesday, we have um, the, we have, I, let's see, let me think about this for a second. IMWCA coming in to do their annual workman's comp audit. So I'll be fairly busy following auditors around those three days. I, see Phil I thought you borrowed Bill's phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there being nothing else, I'll entertain a... I would move to adjourn. Okay. Second. Sandy. Yes, we can adjourn. Okay. <laughs>